This episode is supported by Skillshare. Hi guys, Jade here. Today I wanted to talk about a really interesting problem called the four color map theorem. It's really cool because it was the first phager theorem to be proven with the help of a computer. It caused a lot of controversy because basically no one could understand it. This raised a lot of questions about the nature of mathematics and what really counts as a proof. It also shines a big, uncomfortable light on the limits we may have as humans and asks whether computers may be necessary for the future of mathematics. The story has it that in 1852, a mathematician named Francis Guthrie was coloring the maps of counties of England. Don't ask me why, but anyway, he noticed that he only needed to use four colors so that no two touching counties were the same color. He wondered whether this was the case with all maps, and if so, what was the reason? He sent a message to his brother, Frederick, also a mathematician. He told him about his four color map theorem and wondered if it was a known thing, and if so, why? Little did he know that his questions would go unanswered for over a hundred years. What's interesting is that the question itself is pretty straightforward, so it seems odd that the solution would be so complicated. To understand why, let's first try to prove an easier problem, the five color theorem. It's pretty much exactly the same as the four color theorem, just with five colors. Formally, it states, given a plane separated into regions, the regions may be colored using no more than five colors in such a way that no two adjacent regions receive the same color. So when proving a theorem, three techniques that mathematicians often use are induction, contradiction, and invariance. Luckily for us, this proof involves all three. So let's briefly go through what they all mean before we start. Proof by induction is just showing that as long as you can take the first step, you can take every step after that. Say you want to prove that you can climb to the top of this ladder. There are only two things you need to do. One, prove you can get on the first rung. And two, prove that you can get to the next one from whatever rung you're on. Then it follows that if your proof holds for any step n, it'll hold for any step n plus one. So no matter where the top is, you'll eventually get there. Then there's proof by contradiction. This is a fun one. A couple of weeks ago, I made a video about one of the most fascinating proofs by contradiction, the halting problem. But briefly, instead of directly proving the thing you're trying to prove, you assume the opposite is true and show that it results in a contradiction. For example, if you wanted to prove that there is no biggest number, assume that the opposite is true, that there is a biggest number. Let's call it a bajillion jillion. But say your friend John comes along with the question, what about a bajillion jillion plus one? So you claim that a bajillion jillion is greater than a bajillion jillion plus one. But if we minus a bajillion jillion from both sides, we're left with zero is greater than one, which is a contradiction. This argument could be used for any number. Therefore, no biggest number exists. The third technique is invariance. An invariant is a property that stays the same even when other things in your system change. For example, in Euclidean geometry, the angles of a triangle always add up to 180 degrees. You can do whatever you like to the lengths of the sides or the angles within the triangle, but the 180 degree rule never changes. It's invariant. Cool! So equipped with these three tools of mathematical deduction, let's make a start on this proof. Prove that you only need five colors to color any map so that no two countries sharing a border are the same color. This is gonna be fun. So the first step when solving any mathematical problem is to get rid of any unnecessary information. Here, there's a lot of unnecessary information. We don't care that Italy is shaped like a boot or that Paris is the capital of France. Whoa, 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 whoa. Someone doesn't care about basic geography? I'm not aware of this concept. What's going on here? <laughs> Guys, this is my friend Willy from the YouTube channel Canubus. He's pretty obsessed with geography and he's made a video about maps too, which I've linked in the description. Now, Willy, I'm not saying that I really don't care about what the capital of France is, even though I kind of don't. It just makes this problem easier for us to solve. Okay, if it makes the calculations easier, I'll let it slide. Cool. As I was saying, we only care about two things how many countries and the borders that connect them. So let's transform this map into what's called a graph. 
We can replace all the countries with dots, or vertices as they say, and all the borders with lines that we're going to call edges. When the edges and vertices form a closed loop, this is called a face. We may as well talk like graph theorists if we're going to be proving one of the hardest theorems in graph theory. This is what's called a planar graph, meaning that you can draw it on a piece of paper without any of the edges crossing each other. This is going to be important later. So now if we can colour all the vertices of a planar graph using only five colours, so that no two vertices sharing an edge are the same colour, we've solved the five colour theorem. This is exactly the same model as the map from before, just in a nice neat little package of dots and lines, and no delicious baguettes or pizza to distract us. So it's time to break out our first tool, induction. Proving that every graph is five colourable is pretty ambitious, but the first step of induction is simply showing that you can get on the ladder. In our case, that would be showing that graphs with one vertex can be coloured using five colours. Alright, well that's step one done. Step two, prove that whatever rung you're on, you can always get to the next one. So in our case, that would be assuming that a graph with n amount of vertices is 5 colourable. Prove that a graph with n plus 1 number of vertices is still 5 colourable. Step 2 is a bit harder than step 1. So here's a graph, and let's say it has n plus 1 number of vertices. It doesn't matter about the actual number of vertices, since the rule is supposed to apply to any graph. If we go back to the ladder analogy, it's just like saying it doesn't matter what rung you're on, as long as you show you can get to the next one. So now if we assume that graphs that have n number of vertices are 5 colourable, let's show we can make the jump to graphs of n plus 1 vertices. If we remove a vertex from this graph, it becomes a graph with n vertices, right? And we assumed that graphs with n vertices can be coloured with just five colours. So now let's see if we can colour this graph in such a way that when we add the vertex back, it's still five colourable. Then we'll have proven that if a graph with n vertices is colourable, we can always make the jump to n plus one. But how can we make sure that we can add a fifth colour? It'd be good if we could find a vertex with four neighbours, then we'd be guaranteed to have a fifth colour free. Unfortunately, some graphs don't have a vertex with just four neighbours, but we're going to show in a bit that all graphs have a vertex with five neighbours, and that's good enough. This one has five, so let's take it out. The remaining graph with n number of vertices is five colourable, according to our assumption. Now here comes the fiddly part, so pay close attention. We're going to be dealing with the five neighbours our removed vertex was connected to. Let's call it V. We'll number them in a cyclic manner. One, two, three, four, five. Right now, all the numbered vertices are taking up all five colours. Green, red, yellow, blue, and purple. So we can't bring our removed vertex V back without breaking the five colour theorem. We've got to somehow arrange them so that they only take up four colours. To do this, let's look at 1 and 3 and highlight all the vertices the same colour as them, green and yellow. We can see that vertex 1 isn't connected to any yellows, so we can change it to yellow. Now all the neighbours only take up 4 colours without breaking the rule. So we can bring back our removed node V and give it the fifth colour. This graph n plus 1 is still 5 colourable. Case closed. But not really, this won't always work. Take this graph for example. It's the same one as before, but some of the colours are swapped around. So let's try the same trick as before. Highlight 1 and 3 and mark all the vertices with those colours. But now when we try the old swap we find we can't get rid of any colours without having two connected vertices the same colour. This is because we have this path of yellows and greens from vertex 1 to 3 that we didn't have in our last example. So is the mighty five colour theorem broken then? Not quite. Let's look at vertices 2 and 4. 1 and 3 form a path, blocking 2 and 4 from connecting. So I can just play the old swap with one of them instead. Again, the five vertices only take up four colours. So we can bring back V and colour it in with a fifth colour, and the five colour theorem is saved. You will always be able to do this with any vertex that has five or less neighbours. So how do we know we can always find such a vertex? Well, now it's time for our last proof technique, invariance. Let's bring in an invariant called the Euler characteristic. The Euler characteristic is a rule that for every connected planar graph, the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces is always equal to two. If we start with a vertex on the outer face, we have one vertex and one face. We can do two things to build upon our graph. 
add another vertex and connect them by an edge, or connect two existing vertices with an edge. As you can see, no matter how big we build our graph, the Euler characteristic will always equal two. So equipped with our invariant, let's try out the one remaining proof technique, contradiction. Let's assume that in fact, every vertex needs to have a minimum of six neighbors and there can't be any with five or less. There needs to be at least three times the number of edges as vertices because every edge is shared between two vertices. Now we're going to try and prove that this assumption results in a contradiction. Let's go back to Euler's characteristic for a sec. Every face is made of at least three edges, right? And every edge is shared between two faces. Remember we count the outer face too. So then the number of faces is less than or equal to two thirds the number of edges. So if we plug this inequality into Euler's characteristic, we get that the number of vertices minus edges plus two thirds the number of edges is greater than or equal to two. If we simplify, multiply by three and rearrange, we get that the number of edges is less than or equal to three times the number of vertices minus six. All right, now let's compare this with our assumption. The term E minus three V on the left is the same. So we can write these two equations as one inequality. So then we get that the number of edges minus three times the number of vertices must be smaller than minus six from our theorem, but must be greater than zero from our assumption. This is a contradiction. Therefore, our assumption that the minimum number of neighbors is six is wrong. The vertex with the minimum number of neighbors is five or less. So that means our proof by induction is safe. So to recap, we used proof by induction to show that if a graph with n number of vertices is five colorable, a graph of n plus one is also five colorable. Therefore, any planar graph can be five colorable. However, this is only possible if there is always at least one vertex with five neighbors or less. We proved that by assuming that the opposite was true and showing that it contradicts with the Euler characteristic. And because the vertices, edges and faces were all just stand-ins for countries and their borders, we proved that, yes, any map can be colored using only five colors with no two adjacent countries being the same color. So the five color theorem is true. Hooray! So we can finally answer Guthrie's question. Oh wait, no we can't, he's four colors. So can we extend our proof to four colors then? Well, the reason this proof worked so well is because of the fact that we can always find a vertex with five or less neighbors. But this doesn't help us for the four color case. We need four neighbors or less, which we can't guarantee. The four color proof actually went unsolved for over a hundred years until two mathematicians, Apple and Haken, announced that they'd at last found a proof. The only problem was no one could understand it, not even them. This is where the computer comes into the story. I won't go into the full details of the proof because their paper was 60 pages long, but basically imagine that graphs are separated into two categories, ones that can be colored with four colors or less and ones that need five colors. We already showed that all maps need a minimum of five colors and it's obvious that some maps can be colored with just four colors. So what Apple and Haken needed to do was show that all graphs exist on this side of the line. They did this by proof of contradiction. They needed to show that all graphs have a certain property guaranteeing that you can reduce them in size without ever crossing this line. Basically, it means if they start with five colors, you can always make the number of vertices smaller while still needing five colors. But of course, if you keep making the graph smaller, you'll eventually end up with a graph with four or less vertices and therefore four colorable, which would be on this side of the line. So that means that if all these graphs did in fact have this special property of reducibility, they would all have to have started on this side of the line. The hard part was proving that all graphs on the five color side do indeed have this special property. The strategy that they used was to show that every graph on this side of the line would have to contain one of 2000 configurations guaranteeing the property. Checking them by hand would have been very time consuming. It would have taken months, if not years of time spent tediously coloring in graphs. They needed a computer to do it. And after over a thousand hours of computation, we finally had our answer. 
But yes, all graphs on the five color side did have this special property, meaning they simply couldn't exist without inducing a contradiction. All maps are indeed four colorable. So there you have it, Guthrie. There's your answer. But this feels very different to the proof of the five color theorem. We don't really know why it works. The computer could have just as easily returned a no and we wouldn't have learnt anything different. The mathematics community had a lot of trouble accepting this as a proof. The mathematician Paul Halmo said, I do not find it easy to say what we have learned from all that. And Daniel Cohen said, the mission of mathematics is understanding. Admitting these computer shenanigans to the ranks of mathematics would only leave us intellectually unfulfilled. And you have to admit they're kind of right. But this raises some very interesting questions about the nature of mathematics. Who judges whether or not something is a proof? Are we being arrogant in assuming that math should abide by human understanding? Kenneth Apple said, The computer was much more successful because it was not thinking like a mathematician. Since then, many more mathematical proofs have been provided by computers. Recently, the Boolean Pythagorean triple problem was solved by a computer, running for four years, generating a 200 terabyte proof, which was later compressed to 68 gigabytes. Just enough for a lifetime of reading. This problem started off with someone coloring in maps, but we spent the whole time talking about graphs. That's because all of the information we needed was captured much more effectively in a graph. Different representations can be useful for different things. My friend Willie has made a video all about it. Willie, why don't you give us the lowdown? Thanks, Jade. Wait, hang on. I don't think I can animate myself like this. One second. Yeah, that works. Now, I've always been into maps and geography, but one important thing to realize about just about all maps is that they're all lying to you, in some way or another. Even the most accurate, honest maps are hiding, exaggerating, or misrepresenting something on it. But this is actually so that they could do a better job at showing what they're actually trying to show you. This is why even the most well-designed metro maps are terrible as walking guides. If you're interested, since this video was made as part of a collaboration, head over to my channel, Canubis, to find out more. I've linked that video in the description, so make sure to check it out right after this. The four-color map theorem would never have been solved if it wasn't for the clever methods of thinking us humans have developed as a way to tackle problems. If you'd like to practice some of these skills yourself and get better at problem solving, Skillshare.com is an interactive learning website where you can build your logic and reasoning skills through the thousands of courses they offer. There are plenty on science, technology, programming, and basic problem solving, like how to solve a Rubik's Cube how to work out percentages, and an entire course on discrete mathematics. There are also plenty of basic life skill courses like how to make sushi, and an entire course on how to coil an extension cord. Ooh. Skillshare is offering a special promotion to my viewers where you can get the first two months totally free. To sign up, just use the link on screen, which I've also put in the description. Thanks for watching guys, so you may have noticed that this video was a bit longer and more in depth than my usual videos. And that's because a few weeks ago I posted a poll in the YouTube community tab asking whether you guys did want more in depth videos and the majority of you said yes. So let me know what you thought about this video, um, was it in depth enough, was it too in depth? I hope it was in depth enough because I don't think I could make more in depth videos than this. But yeah anyway, feedback is always appreciated, um, that's it for me, bye!